Welcome to a very special Last Dance recap. We are joined by the Mr. Six Man, Mr. Last no. Dance himself, <laughs> um, no. Jamal yes. Crawford. Jamal, thanks for jumping on with us. We really appreciate it. Of let's course. Get, let's jump right in. Jay, wh what have you liked most about these episodes? Going back to Curtin, you know, obviously uh, seeing so many different people, even playing for the Bulls and seeing familiar faces, guys I haven't seen in forever, and, and watching them in that element when things were crazy for the Bulls. And, and watching the Tim Hallums, you know what I mean, and the, and the leagues, the equipment managers, guys who have been there 20, 30 years, so I got a chance to know the time I was there. And then just seeing how he was, Michael was with his teammates, seeing the interaction. And one of the things I love about it is that the fact that it's his film, right? But he, even the stuff that's against him, he's not having people take out, like, no, I don't say that. Like, if you didn't agree with him, he still let you speak your piece, and I really appreciate that part. There's been a lot of Isaiah Thomas. Jamal, that's why you wear 11. You're, yeah, absolutely. I, you're an Isaiah Thomas, but you're also a Jordan. Stan. A Jordan. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so where do you come down between that with, with kind of watching that feud play out again? Well, I think that just shows the, the competitiveness they both had. And that's how it was in that time period. Like, if they didn't like each other, it was no hidden thing. Like, they didn't like each other. They respect each other and their talents. But they just didn't like each other. And, and that still kind of carries over to this day, at least how it comes across. But the respect as players has never left. Mm -hmm. I knew you grew up a big Kobe Bryant fan. Yeah, absolutely. When you saw in the love and memory of Kobe Bryant, what did you think? What were your thoughts, your emotions? You know what, BT, watching that and then, because it's weird because I still click on Kobe's name now to see new articles, whatever. And it has, you know, August 23rd, 1978, and then January 26, 2020. And, and seeing that timeline and seeing like, wow, he's really not here in the physical, it will never feel real to me. And I tweeted that last night, it'll never feel real. And it's just amazing that he's not here, that his family's not here, that the other kids aren't there, the other kids' family's not here. It's just, it's something I'll never get over, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I think you, I mean, you hit it. It, it was um, seeing him interviewed, seeing him as a kid and then seeing him interviewed, it's like, I was sad that we won't get to hear him right. in other documentaries, get to right. hear, kind of like, kind of get into that brain that he has. We're not, we, we lose his voice and, and that's sad. And I think like, you know, kind of strangely to, to, to turn this, like, that's the thing I think you, you, you said it. What I've enjoyed most about this is that we're getting to hear Jordan talk. Yeah. Like we're getting to hear him F bomb talk about why he doesn't think he gambles too much as they right. cut to a clip of him gambling clearly way too much with people <laughs> and stuff. Right. And it's like, like, I like that. Like we are hearing him kind of narrate his story in, in a way that, I don't feel like we ever have before. No. And it's not packaged. You know what I mean? Like I said, it's easy to say. He didn't even have to address the gambling thing. He didn't have to address the Republicans buy sneakers. He didn't have to address any of that because it's ultimately his film. But he said, no, I want to meet it head on. And knowing Michael and, and everything I thought before I met him, everything I've seen after I met him, he's always been straight up and honest. Like the whole Isaiah Dream Team thing. He, I think he's so honest and he's so upfront whether you like it or not, from his Hall of Fame speech to everything he said, if he didn't want him on the dream team and he did that, he would say, hey, I did it. I did it. Nobody else liked him, whatever he felt. But he didn't. And I, I trust his word that he didn't do that. Well, tell me this. From having met MJ and now seeing his documentary, what have you learned from the documentary that you didn't know from those times you guys had conversations? Well, to be honest with you, that's the MJ I met. Mm. It was like, yeah. Do you know the, the thing that shocked me most about him? And you can see some of it in the documentary with the F-bombs or just being normal when, you know, around, around his teammates. And he was so normal. I couldn't get past that. I remember one time we went from the gym. His restaurant was kind of close by. He left the gym and walked right by himself. No security, no nothing. People were driving down the street honking, going crazy. And he just walked like he was just normal. I was like, I was blown away by that. But I think you're starting to see how normal he was. And, I mean, considering, obviously, right, with who he is, his stature. First of all, he probably did that about the Dream Team. Oh, I can't curse. Sorry. <laughs> but, but, damn, my thing is he's, he's been straight up. He's addressed every single thing. You don't think he would say, hey, all right, I said I I think he's I kind of said it in the past, too. Like, he said it in the McCallum book. He kind of addresses that. Like, it was like, I wasn't going to play if he plays. So, I mean, I think there's some gray area there. But it's, it, say there's gray area. I think he wasn't the one that said, I don't want him on the team. Like, maybe they'd said, hey, we're not putting him on the team. And he may have said, okay, or whatever. Yeah. But I don't blink, think he Blink twice. Blink twice if you don't want to play with Isaiah Thomas. And Michael was like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, I, I, I think, you, you know, you, you said that. Like, the, the kind of normalcy and stuff in him. 
um, you know, for people like me, like he's never been normal. What was it like the first time you met Michael Jordan? And, the fir- and, and yeah, just tell us that story. I love this. Story. The, the first time, the first time I met him, my dad had told me during the draft process, he was like, Hey, MJ likes your game. I'm like this before social media. I'm like, come on, dad, there's no way. There's no possible way you could know this. Right. I get drafted by the Bulls. Fast forward, it's kind of the beginning or middle of the rookie season. And Tim Grover, who I knew and was kind of working out with at times, called me. He was like, hey, MJ said you can meet him. It's probably 6, 6.30 in the morning. I get down there by 7, down there at, uh, at Hoops. It's just in the weight room. It's just MJ, Tim Grover, and me. And I'll never forget, I walked in, and MJ was doing these, like, defensive slide drills. All right, like, there's a 40-year-old about to come back doing defensive slide drills. He had been there since, I think, 5.30 or 6. We talked. He's like, hey. You know, I like your game. This summer we can work out. And it just took off from there. And he really grew fond of me and my game. And it, it was before I even proved anything in the NBA. But he knew kind of coming into it, he liked the way I played or whatever. And come to fast forward, my dad actually went to school with Amal Rashad at Oregon. He played there with, with Kevin Love's dad. So that's how he knew MJ liked my game. Amal Rashad had told him. My, na- my dad never told me that Amal Rashad was his source. You know what I mean? Or the person that told him. So I was like, Dad, you're crazy. You're out your mind. And so that relationship took off. I used to go to MJ's house all the time. Uh, he picked me to be in the Gatorade commercial with him. And we just worked out together and never lost. We played two straight summers, never lost again. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. Jay, bro, where's my Gatorade, man? You in a commercial? Hey, I was. I was the one. It was the 39 versus 23. Wow. Yeah, it was really cool. Really, really cool. We shot at the United Center, actually. When you went to MJ's house, mm-hmm. how much money did you lose playing cards? I didn't play cars. I wasn't a car player. What we did was when I went there, actually, we played uh, five on five. There's a bunch of people there playing, and we played. And we didn't lose then either. So we just played hoops, shot pool, just talked. You know, it was just it was, he had like a setup, like a lounge area off his court. So we guys shot pool, watch TV, watch Sports Center, whatever. So we just hung out, showed me around some places. It was really cool. That's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah I'm super jealous. That's super cool. Man. <laughs> like, it, it's it's just. I want to ask you a Bulls question real quick while we have you here. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that Chicago in this documentary reminded me of is like just how big and it's seemingly like how you couldn't tear the Bulls down. Like that they were this like upper top tier organization Mm -hmm. and and, and they've been good since then. They've had good teams, but they haven't been that level. Yeah. Yeah. How much of that do you think is because of kind of the way this last dance ends with, Phil leaving, MJ leaving, Scotty well, leaving. Yeah. yeah. Well, Kraus drafted me. So I would spend so much time in his office picking his brain about everything. But mm. at the time I was a rookie, uh, if you go back and look, I think Tim Duncan, Grant Hill, and Tracy McGrady were free agents. Yep. And Kraus really believed that we were going to get all three of them. He was like, we're going to get all of them. He had, because they had enough money and, you know, cap space. And he believed that. And we struck out. And then we kind of, you know, we're the two youngest teams. Uh, we're the youngest team for two years in a row when I was there. So we kind of, then we started getting like Jalen Rose and guys like that who were proven it could help kind of push the young guys along. Uh, but we never did get the T-Mac, the Grant Hill, or, or Tim Duncan. Interesting you bring up Jared Krause's name because yeah. he's been vilified in that. Yeah. So the cross you knew and the one we're seeing now, what's the difference between those two people? The part about him being like driven and stubborn and he believed what he believed that that part didn't change, you know, but it's amazing going back to look at it because I didn't know the dynamics of those two to that degree. Like I knew he put it together. I, I didn't know, you know, if Phil goes 82 and no, he's not coming back. Like I wasn't watching it like that. I was more watching Jordan and the, and the rest of the thing and they ended it. You know, I just, I just didn't know why, but seeing it this part is like, wow. Like, and obviously, you know, he, want to move forward he want to move on and who knows you would have to ask him or I think the, the book obviously passed away but the book that he has coming out I think kind of addresses some of that of why he broke it up or whatever but yeah he was ready to move on who knows how many t- titles they could have won you know Jay before but he also let, put it together so it's kind of weird weird dynamic. yeah it, it, it is a weird dynamic I mean yeah. I think watching Michael just be like merciless with him has been like there was a couple times last night where it's like they just won a title and Jerry Krause, this guy who drafted Scottie Pippen, who drafted Horace Grant, is like, can I get a cigar? And he's like, it'll stunt your growth. And he walks away. <laughs> it's just but sad. See, see, that type of stuff, come <laughs> to me, it resonates with how competitive Michael is to winning. All roads, no matter how you know, blunt he can be, they all lead back to winning. If he thinks you're trying to lessen his chance of winning, 
or less than, you know what I mean? Like, I think it all comes back to his competitiveness and how he wants to win. What other, you're, you're my favorite hoops historian that, that we get to talk to about this. <laughs> Thank you. What would be some other teams in your mind that you'd like to see kind of deconstructed like this or some other players that, that get the real splice it up, long form kind of style uh, dissection? Well, players, definitely Kobe. I think LeBron's would be interesting just to see his journey. People forget, even with LeBron, right? He was on the cover of Sports Illustrated that said chosen one before he played a game. The hype that he had around to even get close to the hype was out of control. And he's past that hype. You know what I mean? Like he's been unbelievable from high school or since he's been discovered on. So I think those three kind of stand out to me, the guys who, if we just did individuals. Teams, I would think Golden State would be a really good one uh, just to kind of follow and kind of feel back the, the layers there as well. Jamal Crawford, man. Thank you, brother. Uh, thank, thank you, guys. Business, no problem. Man.